So let me, let me tell you about the future. On Wednesday, February 26th, 2020, some of you will be here and you will line up in this aisle here and I will put ashes on your forehead. And I will say, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. For many people, me included, Ash Wednesday is always one of the most powerful moments of the entire year. Yeah, Christmas is great. Yeah, Easter is great. Um, baptisms and confirmation, every Sunday is great. But there is something very basic, something very real something very deep going on when we receive those ashes and we hear those words remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return so here's a crazy thought what if we did that every week really what if every week we were reminded of our mortality and that after we die, we're going to have to make an account of our lives before God. That's what Ash Wednesday is, is about. That's what Lent is about. Ash Wednesday is an in-your-face reminder. Come on, pay attention. In-your-face reminder. Ash Wednesday is a powerful, no holds barred, nothing nuanced about it, straight in your face reminder that there is something called Judgment Day. And that'll be a day when there's no secrets. A day when nothing that is hidden will be hidden anymore. It's a day when those things done in darkness will come to light. It will be all right out there in the open. So what if we were reminded of that, not just on Ash Wednesday, not just during Lent, but what if we had that reminder every week? What if that unavoidable, inevitable reality was a greater part of your consciousness? Would that change anything in your life? Might you actually become a different kind of person? Or would your life just be same old, same old? Well, I don't know about you, but I need this reminder. I need a regular reminder of my accountability for God, before God. That's something that's very helpful for me. And I receive that reminder every week, and you do too, right here on Sunday without ashes. It's called the confession. In just a few minutes, we're going to say this. We're going to say, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men. We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness. There it is, boom. Judge of all men. A weekly reminder of our accountability before God. And as I said, I for one happen to need that. But even that, is that really enough? Is this one time a week reminder, this just once every seven day reminder of our accountability before God, is that sufficient to do the job? And what is the job anyway? I mean, what does the confession seek to accomplish in our lives? Is the confession just a bookkeeping kind of, of, of thing? Sort of a spiritual balancing mechanism? Or could there be something much bigger 
much deeper, much more significant than that going on? Well, there just could be. So hold that thought. For the past few weeks, we've been doing a sermon series called Taking It Home. And the idea in this series is that there can be great benefit to us if we did the things we do on Sunday all through the week. In other words, if we take it home. Well, today we want to consider this practice of confession. What really is going on here? And why is it probably more important than we think it is? Confession. Let's take a look. First of all, let's clear, clarify something, if, if, if we could. When I say, say confession, I'm not talking about that. Now, some of y'all, when you were, you know, in your past, maybe uh, when you were younger or, or at some point in your life, you, you did that. You went in this special booth and, 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 and you confess out loud to a priest who's sitting on the other side of a screen or, or a separation of, of some sort. The priest would then declare your sins forgiven, uh, absolution, and you would be assigned certain acts of penance in order to demonstrate the sincerity of your confession. That's not what I'm talking about. Now I do need to say at this point, just sort of interject, that in the Anglican Church in North America, we do offer verbal confession to a priest. We do. Um, but it's not required and, and we don't have those booths. There's a, a rule of thumb, a, a guideline for this, if you will, for a verbal confession, and it's this. All may, none must, and some should. And what that means is this. Everybody is welcome and invited to confess in person, verbally, to a priest. But no one is required to do that. And for some people, for their spiritual and emotional well-being, it's important that they actually do that. They should confess verbally out loud to a priest and hear in return verbally out loud that God uh, forgives their sins. But when it comes to taking confession home with you, that is not what I'm talking about. Here's what I'm talking about. So imagine you're driving down the freeway, minding your own business, when some idiot, moron, imbecile, zooms by you and cuts you off. Huh? How do you feel? What is your response? What do you think? Well, I think uh, that I've probably just told you how I feel. Um, and, and I was talking about that with some, some folks recently. And I said, you know, my response to that, it, the way I respond, you, at least, idiot, um, that's a problem. Because it should not be that way. Here's why. You know, no matter what that person has done, um, or how I feel, that person is a human being, and that person is loved by God. And whether that person knows it or not, Jesus died for them. And that should matter to me. That should matter to me a lot. It should matter to me a million zillion times more than getting cut off in traffic. Do you remember what Jesus said in today's gospel lesson? He said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you or cut you off in traffic. Okay, that's implied. But I don't instinctively do that. It, it, instead of calling that person a blankety blank so-and-so, here's what I should do. I should be concerned for that person and their well-being. I should wonder, why are they driving so irresponsibly? You know, maybe there's some sort of problem going on in their life. Maybe they have a loved one in the hospital. Or maybe they're sick and about to throw up. I don't know. But what I do know is that Jesus said to pray for those who, who, who persecute you. And so the least I can do is pray for somebody who's not even persecuting me. All they did is cut me off in traffic. Unfortunately, that's not normally my initial response. Far from it. So I need to confess that. When that happens, I shouldn't do that. I know I shouldn't do it. So I need to confess it. I need to say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. But here's where we get to the really, really, really important part. This is big, so please listen up. Linked to confession, there always, always, always needs to be self-examination. I mean, why do I respond so aggressively to something so minor? I mean, what's the big deal? Am I in such a hurry? Is my time so precious that a nanosecond or two actually matters? I don't think so. Or could there be something deeper going on? You know, maybe it's some sort of distorted, twisted, macho thing. You know, I want to be the alpha dog of the freeway. Or maybe it's all about competition. I love competition and I love to win. Is that part of this? I don't know. But I do know this. I do know that my instinctive response when somebody cuts me off to think you're a such and such and so and so, I know that that's wrong. You remember our reading from 1 John. He said this, he said, by this we may know that we are in him, that is we're in Christ. Um, whoever says he abides in Christ ought to walk in the same way in which he walked, or in this case, would, would be driving. And I have to own it. I have to be true. I have to tell the truth. I have to be honest, and I have to say, I do not instinctively do that. And I have to ask myself, why not? And this why question, it's huge, it's big. It, because if we don't ask ourselves why we do what we do, we will just keep on doing what we do. So in my case, in this, in this instant, I will cuss a guy in the freeway and say, Oh gosh, I'm sorry God, forgive me. And all will be fine until the next guy cuts me off on the freeway. And I'll cuss and confess and cuss and confess and cuss and confess and on and on it will go. Unless I examine myself, I stop and, 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 and try to assess what, what, is, what is really going on here. Because if I don't, the cycle will continue forever. Have you ever been caught in that, that cycle? You do something, you confess it, you do something, confess it, you do something, confess it. You just, it just keeps happening over and over again. You know better. And yet you just, you can't break out of the cycle. Well, I think asking this why question, why can't I stop doing this? Why do I keep doing this? Well, I think when we begin to, 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 to stop for a minute, something will begin to happen. And see, the next time you do it, whatever it is, 
and from then on whenever you do it, awareness will set in. And you'll be aware that something needs to change in your life. And the more often that happens, the more often you will come to be aware that you need help to make that change. And the more aware you are, the more often it happens, the more you will ultimately just fall on your knees and recognize that you need God's help. You can't change yourself by yourself. Well, guess what? God loves nothing more than to help you with it. Whatever it is. One of the coolest word pictures in, in the, the Bible is this. You all are familiar with it. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hands. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a basic mistake that's really easy for us Christians to make. And that is the scorekeeping or accounting model of Christianity. And that is, okay, when I sin, there's a black mark uh, in my, my, the book of my life in heaven. But if I confess it, that black mark, that sin will be erased from my book. And that's true. It's true. Confessed sin is forgiven sin. But there's much, much more. You see, what God wants for you is not just a clean balance sheet. But what God wants for you is a brand new you. A new you who is victorious over those habitual instinctive sins. What God wants is a new you who has broken out of that cycle. And when we, when we examine our lives and, and acknowledge our help for God, our need for God's help, then God gets involved. Then God, like, like, like a potter, He works with us to mold us and, and shape us and, and to help us like, like, like clay and, and, and help us to form new, new habits, healthy habits, God-honoring habits. As God shapes us and molds us, we get a new life. We get new instincts. We get a new you. But don't think the process is easy. Don't hear me say that. No, it's not easy and it's not quick. Sin has a deep hold on you. He's got a deep hold on me. He's got a deep hold on, it has a deep hold on all of us. We are all clay that is deeply flawed and damaged. And that's why it is so important that confession and self-examination are linked. Those two things... That's the, the process by which the potter works with us like clay to make us into something new, something beautiful in his eyes. And that's why weekly confession on Sunday, while it's good and important and necessary, is not enough. We all need the potter to work with us daily so that we can become the new person that God wants us to be. The new person that we can be. And ultimately that is the deeper purpose of confession. Confession is not just about balancing the books. It's not just about erasing 
sin from God's memory. It's that, but there's more. Confession, when linked with self-examination, is God's way of making us into better people, new people, more Christ-like people. And that's what I want and hope for in my life, and I hope that you do too. So, if you see me driving down the freeway, with a little space between my car and the car in front of me, and you are tempted to zoom by me and cut me off, well, do what you think is right. But remember, followers of Jesus should walk as Jesus walked or drive as Jesus would drive. But if you just can't help yourself and you cut me off anyway, relax. I won't honk at you. I won't ride your tailpipe. I won't do anything like that. But what I will do, or I'll try to do anyway, is pray for you. Look how far I've come. Confession and self-examination. You know, this stuff really works. Amen.